Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dan Norris talking in case the square isn't lit up and you can't tell who I am. Um, before we begin our meetings tonight, I want to just make a statement that the board met in executive session prior to this evening's public meeting to discuss personnel issues and agency business, which if discussed in public would violate a lawful privilege. And, and now the Public Safety Committee, uh, led by uh, Commissioner Irv Brockington. Thank you, Mr. President. Good evening, everyone. So we're gonna open up the Public Safety Committee meeting for today, Wednesday, October 13th. We're gonna start off with a report from our Lieutenant John Slavin. And Lieutenant, you can take it Great. away. Good evening, everyone. Um, item A on the uh, report, police clearance, juvenile contact reports for the month of August, 2021. I see the attachment there. Are there any questions regarding A? Commissioners, any questions in reference to the report that was given to us? Hearing no questions, oh, okay. I... Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Chair, Rappaport. It's not really a yes, question. I just Rappaport. wanted to thank uh, Lieutenant Slavin for the uh, various patrol cars that we've been seeing in the last couple of days on Greenwood Avenue and along Church Road uh, for traffic calming. That's uh, very refreshing. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Appreciate it. Um, Lieutenant Slavin, can you sort of speak to that particular issue and what you know, sort of, I don't know if you want to make it public, what your plans are in reference to that, if it's, if it's something that can be given to sure. the public? Sure, Commissioner, no problem. Um, as everyone knows, this uh, Greenwood Avenue area, the Washington Lane area, Church Road area, that Wincote area there, um, traffic issues there are, are a major concern for our residents and have been so for a while now. Um, we're trying to take a proactive approach to try to address this, a multi-pronged approach to try to address this uh, neighbor concern as best we can. One of the things that's out there is increased visibility in the area there. Um, we have additional patrol officers sitting out there. We have units out there um, just to try, uh, try to slow traffic down, increase visibility in our presence in the location area to try to help the problem. Now, I know that during the rush hour, you know, usually traffic is backed up there. Um, are we seeing, you know, what have you been seeing or your officers and telling you they've been seeing? I know it's only been maybe a couple of days, but are they seeing, you know, speeders or is it more it's just volume? It's it's the volume there, Commissioner. As, you're, as everyone knows, that's a heavily traveled route there. It's a major connector route to a major RE309. Um, so we're seeing a bulk of traffic, especially during the rush hour at periods in the morning and in the late afternoon. Um, Traffic there gets backed up pretty good there, just the sheer volume of it. Okay, all right. Thank you, commissioners. Any other questions in reference to the clearance and juvenile report? All right, so we're gonna move on to item 1B. We have several announcements that our lieutenant's gonna to handle tonight. Yes, sir, commissioner. Um, these are involving police commendations of merit and unit citations uh, to be presented to the members of the police department. Specifically, a merit citation to Detective Ryan Murray uh, relating to an investigation of arrest of uh, persons involved in illegal straw purchasing and sales of firearms. Um, this was a direct result of a uh, shooting incident that happened in 2020 in Melrose Park. And due to his diligence and investigation in this, uh, it led to several, several arrests for the straw purchases of uh, firearms. Um, so he'll be receiving that merit citation for his efforts. Um, the next one is a merit citation for Detective Matt Gonglet relating to an investigation and arrest of a person wanted for a series of burglaries and sexual assaults in early 2001. Uh, Matt did a great job. There was a series of uh, burglaries and uh, these type of assaults in our area and in surrounding communities as well. And Matt had developed DNA information to help identify the person responsible for that. So why that's, that's why he's receiving his recognition. Uh, the next one up is a unit citation for Officer Stuart Coyle, Officer Mark Ginhart, Officer Kevin Smith, and Officer Brian Walsh for a vehicle uh, crash rescue with entrapment that it took place at the Cheltenham Square Mall. Uh, the victim had been ejected from the car, was trapped into the car. The officers physically lifted the car up to save the person's life and get him out of there. Tremendous effort, uh, great teamwork that, that day as well. Um, and the next one is a unit citation uh, issued to Detective Sergeant Rich Schaefer, Officer Christian Dobush, and Officer Chad Smith for the successful resolution of the suicidal subject incident. Um, this was a, uh, some days you're lucky, 
you're better to be lucky than good. We were really lucky to stay. We had the right people in the right place at that day to help someone who was in a, a dire straits. And uh, um, they were able to relate with this officer through military experience. Some of the officers there with a military background, they were able to relate to this person, um, talk him down, de-escalate the situation, safely resolve the situation, saving this man's life. So that was the uh, unit citation for those involved. It was a terrific, terrific job. That includes item B. Any any questions before we move forward? Mr. Chairman? At all, for Yes, Commissioner Zygmuntfeld. Just wanted to add one that isn't in this list, but certainly deserves acknowledgement. And many commissioners have already done that. Uh, Lieutenant Slave and the arrest of the stabbing suspect in the Chelton Avenue smoke shop. I think it was very reassuring. We also know that there was an arrest of... Um, of the carjacking and armed robbery suspects. So both of those were kind of crimes that had some high visibility and things happened quickly. And, and a lot of times the resolution of those crimes and the quick solution does not get communicated publicly. I think it's important that we do that because there's a certain level of insecurity when those kinds of high visibility incidents occur. So an acknowledgement of the great work. And also it's important, I think, that we need to find a way to better report and communicate how those have been resolved and the quality of the work that goes on day in and day out. So everybody you know, appreciates and thanks the work that's been done by the force on those. And Commissioner, I'd like to thank you very much for acknowledging that. And I have passed on your, uh, your accolades to our officers that were involved in this job. And uh, they're very appreciative of everyone getting back to them and thanking them for their efforts. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Norris. Um, just, just a quick follow-up. I, I couldn't agree more with what Commissioner Zygmunt Feld just stated. Um, and uh, though it's not a large group tonight, uh, I just want to uh, restate or reinforce that our, these uh, citations that are listed here, as well as the two incidences just mentioned by uh, Commissioner Zygmuntfeld, which uh, were successfully, um, where the police were successful in uh, uh, capturing uh, those responsible. Uh, this is what our police department does day in and day out for us, 365 days a year. Um, and uh, I wanna make it clear that uh, representing all the commissioners and the staff, um, and so to the police department and for the community listening, we couldn't be prouder of our police department and we thank them for all the work that they do. Yes, sir. Thank you, Commissioner Norris. Any other statements from any other commissioners? All right, seeing none, we're gonna move forward. Uh, I will take over and handle item 1C. Recommend the Board of Commissioners approve two purchase orders to Cody Systems, one in the amount of $3,049.81 to renew our annual subscription for the 2020 year and one in the amount of $3,855 to renew the annual subscription for the 2021 year. Um, and those bills are attached. Any questions from commissioners? Seeing none, I call. I'm uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. One. Yes, if, if I may. Are, are those years correct that we're, we're renewing a subscription for 2020 and 2021? I would think it would be 2021 and 2022. Actually, it's it's by my if I may, Commissioner, it's 2020 and 2021. I guess due to the pandemic, there was a uh, a, a gap we in the bill. 2020. The bill. We never paid 2020, and they brought it to our attention. Got it. Okay. All right, so we're correct with that. Yes. So with that being um, stated, I call the question item 1C. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. We're going to move on to item 1D. Recommend the Board of Commissioners approve the purchase to Hivis in the amount of 23560 to upfit the five 2021 police vehicles. Those bill debt invoice is also attached to this report. Any questions from commissioners in reference to item 1D? Mr. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Commissioner. I mean, yes. <laughs> Our town said manager. He just demoted him. Thank you. Your salary, big time. Your, your salary just went down. My <laughs> um, I, just, I just want to uh, commend uh, Lieutenant Slavin for bringing this forward. Uh, in the past years, this would not come before the board uh, for your approval of this. So just want to uh, commend Lieutenant Slavin for bringing this in front of the board for your review and approval. Thank you. Um, Lieutenant Slavin, for those who may not have the report and able to read it, 
quick synopsis on what's the meaning of upfit. So this way our residents, somebody may be on a phone call and may not have the report in front of them to send the invoice. Yes, for the Cody system, our, our Cody system, we share that with the surrounding police departments. The Cody Cobra system especially is, gives us an interface to interact with, say, Abington Police to access to their reports, especially, okay. especially beneficial in investigations where we have a suspect in mind that may, they may be dealing with the same uh, individual or so. So we're able to share information that way with other agencies. And I know right. we've done it specifically with the Abington Police in the past. It's been very helpful. All right, so that's the Cody system. What about it to upfit? What, what, do, what do we mean by upfitting the five um, vehicles? Yes, sir. What that is, we have new vehicles each year. Uh, we're in a, we're in a, into a new model year of car. We would uh, decommission the old vehicles and uh, uh, switch the equipment over. Sometimes that equipment can't be used again. Sometimes it can fit into the car. They change the designs of the car. Um, that would include the shield, all the other uh, 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 Instrument, instrumentation they put in the vehicle for our equipment, for our radios, and that's such. Uh, and the windows, uh, the, the side uh, bars for the windows, that kind of stuff to secure the vehicle as well when we're doing prisoner transports in there. So that's that's what that involves, the light bars, the sirens, all the electronics, um, the, the side signals, the, uh, the spotlights, those type of things. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions from commissioners, item 1D, I call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, now we're gonna have an update. Item 1DE is an update of the Pennsylvania Chief of Police Association reaccreditation um, for 1021 2021 <laughs> yes, yes, sir, Commissioner. As you know, we're up for reaccreditation for our Pennsylvania Chiefs of Police uh, accreditation. Um, Sergeant Jero Francis has done the lion's share of work here. This is something that takes approximately three years in the making to get to where we're at. Um, it involves a lot of policy review, rewriting, um, updating our, our building, our procedures, and the, the equipment we have to enable us to meet the standards that the, uh, that the chiefs um, shoot for. So it's a very involved process. It's a three-year process. Sergeant Francis has done a great job. We're ready for this. Our assessors will be out on the 20th to review all our policies and procedures to make sure we're following the best practices in law enforcement, number one. And then on the 21st, we'll be out here to visit our facility. We'll do a tour of our facility, our equipment. We'll do static displays at the police station here for the assessors. And uh, they'll also do a ride along with our officers. We'll take them for a ride through the township. They'll ask them about the department and uh, go over some of the things that they're, they've uncovered in, our, in their review of our department. They ask our officers uh, specific questions. So we're ready for that. I'm looking forward to completing that. And a lot of work is going into that. Okay. Any questions from commissioners in reference to item 1E? I don't know if that's something that, if that's just an update, if that's something that we need to vote on. No. I don't believe we need to vote on that, okay? We're gonna move to item 1F, which is again, some recognition, and I am gonna let Lieutenant Slavin go over um, item F, subset A and B, C, D, and E. Yes. Okay, uh, Commissioner, um, the first one is the Montgomery County District Attorney's Officers Law Enforcement and Civilian Accommodation Ceremony. Um, this was held this year, uh, October 7th, 2021. Um, one of our uh, detectives, Detective Matt Hungerford, was recognized by District Attorney Kevin Steele for his efforts in our Walmart uh, active shooter that we had in 2018. Um, there was no ceremony due to COVID and due to some of the delay in, in, uh, in uh, recognizing this. So District Attorney uh, Steele wanted to recognize Officer Matt Hungerford as he was the first officer on location that day. His actions set the tone for the job. He immediately responded to go in there and there was five victims shot, as you remember, at that job. And uh, he did a ter terrific job. And the district attorney's off, uh, the district attorney attended the hearing, obviously at the trial. Um, the person received a significant sentence for, for their actions there, but he recognized Officer Hunger for his job, also testifying in that case and how he was key to uh, prosecution in that case. So that was on the 7th of October. Item B is a thank you letter from Upper Dublin Township. As we know, uh, Upper Dublin got creamed in the, in the tropical storm Ida. They were hit by a tornado on September the 1st. Um, this is a letter we received from uh, the Board of Commissioners there thanking Sergeant Joseph O'Neill for his assistance uh, during their time of need. That's September 1st. Um, the next item, item C, is a letter from the Lower Moraine Township uh, Fire Department thanking us for their support um, and in our efforts to attend the uh, funeral of uh, one of the firefighters, Officer Sean DeMarcus, that was killed 
uh, and uh, we came to their aid and assistance. And it was just an acknowledgement of Sergeant Dan Schaefer's efforts that day uh, to attend and assist them in the township of Lower Marion, that was. Um, item D is a thank you letter for Moss Rehabilitation uh, involving Officer Dave Sprango, uh, who responded to a call at the location there. Uh, one of the highlights of this is that the uh, person is um, uh, Julia Cohen is, is the Director of Quality and Education for Moss Rehabilitation. She's the author of the letter. She singled out Dave to thank him for being professional and uh, kindly supporting a person in the hospital out who's in need of care. She acknowledged his skill and effective interaction with this person, and she wanted to thank him for it. So that was uh, Officer Dave Sparango that was recognized in that one. And uh, lastly, there's a letter from um, a Susan Goldstein. A, she's a Haverford uh, Township resident. Um, she unfortunately had the uh, bad fortune of being out in the middle of a storm <laughs> during Hurricane Ida. Um, she, she was in assistance. She lost her GPS. She kind of really lost her way there. We came across Kevin O'Donnell, one of our police officers here, who went over and above to help her, uh, you know, give her directions how to get home, help her navigate around the floodwaters there to get her safely out of the area. Um, she was so impressed with uh, Officer Kevin O'Donnell that she wrote a thank you letter and, uh, you know, acknowledged his professionalism. So uh, it was very nice. These officers were, all these letters were shared with the officers and, you know, and I was given my thanks as well uh, for their efforts. Thank you, thank you, Lieutenant. And on behalf of the commissioners, please, um, all the officers here, again, uh, Commissioner Nar stated it earlier, how much we appreciate the efforts and the hard work that you guys do every day. Before we move on to um, the fire marshal report, I don't think I've called the question, um, the, uh, the report from the police chief, um, item A and B. Um, so I would like to go back and call the question item 1A and 1B. All those in favor of approving item uh, 1A and 1B, the, re the receipt of those reports, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Slavin. We're going to move on now. We are happy to have back on our rolls um, after a slight um, accident. We're, going to <laughs> We're happy to have back on our rolls our fire, Scott Lynch. Uh, Mr. Lynch, you're looking good. Thank you, Commissioner. Good evening, everyone. Um, yes. The only thing I want to point out uh, from the August uh, Fire Board meeting bullet point number four regarding 515 Star Road, the building is uh, has passed all of its expressions and has been reoccupied. Um, since we uh, the September video. Fire Board meeting was canceled because uh, a lot of our resources were uh, up in Upper Dublin um, handling uh, or assisting them with their emergencies with the tornado and stuff like that. So uh, we just made the decision to uh, cancel the meeting. Other than that, is there any questions on anything uh, from my report? Mr. Chairman? Commissioner Zemmichel. Uh, good evening and welcome back, Scott. No lumps on the noggin. No, thank you. Uh, two things. Um, you, you provided a very detailed uh, description of some of the uh, outside aid from some of the other fire companies, so thank you. What I thought was particularly telling on that was the um, amazingly quick response time. If you look at all those reports, um, once there, there is a notification, the response occurs quickly and the arrival time, you know, everything happens literally within five to 10 minutes maximum. So we have to acknowledge the fact that the, our outside aid, uh, mutual aid relationships are working effectively. And I think it's important to also, you know, we don't have that um, listed, the, the times and stuff for Cheltenham Fire Company's responses in mutual aid. But I'd like to request that next month, you also include our responses in mutual aid situations to our outside neighbors. I think that's important. So that was point one. Not that I want to give you too much work, but I don't think it'll prove differently than, um, than what's happening uh, with our neighbors and how we're responding. And Upper Dublin is an incredible example of, of how we reciprocate and initiate support. My next question is a little different, and that is that what I'd like to do, um, uh, there's been some representations regarding response times on fires uh, in the center of the township. 
Um, and I'd like next month for there to be some type of report that talks about the deployment of both, uh, of both uh, uh, firefighters and the deployment of apparatus, because there's been some questioning made by uh, individuals outside of our existing four companies about that the performance, and I'd like that to be quickly, um, uh, if, it's, if it's a rumor or a false representation, I'd like that to be quickly debugged and basically put to bed so that there's no more of, of that kind of discussion being made without any support or documentation. So I'm asking you for that because I think uh, it's important to reassure the township since we made the determination or decision to decertify um, Ogon's Fire Company, there have been uh, outside representations about things that, that aren't being done. What I, can, what I can comfortably state is that our fire companies have represented us in both private and public meetings that uh, the performance and the interaction between companies has never been better. I think that's something uh, reassuring to the public. And as I asked uh, Lieutenant Slavin to, to, you know, to do a little more and for us to do a little more in promoting the fire, the uh, police activities and resolution. I'd like to ask the same of you, Mr. Lynch, that we do that to make sure that our citizens know whatever decisions we make, whatever empowerment we give to both our police, fire, EMS, and all our public safety resources, we do so with the utmost concern of first and foremost safety and protection for our residents. So not that I want to be on a soapbox, but when I hear things that are unwarranted and unsupported, I want to make sure that there is factual um, support to say what is versus what isn't. That's fine. I will uh, take care of that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, Fire Marshal Lynch, do you ever, you know, similar to what our police do, will, will always give us information about their officers who go beyond the call of duty. Um, it would be great to hear that from your side also. Yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, make sure that will start happening without a problem. Yeah, we'd love to hear that from your side. Um, Are there any other there. questions in I reference got, to the report? I got one more thing to add. If I I'm can sorry. Add. Yes, go ahead. Um, so next month, I'll attach this to you guys so you have it. But um, just so the commissioners are aware, uh, between false fire alarms and uh, some other fire code enforcements, um, $17,230 has been brought in this year um, in fines. And we've uh, decided between Bob, Nate and I, we've decided to do an 80-20 split. 80% 80 of that returns to the fire company. And you'll see in the spreadsheet that's been created, it'll be a breakdown of how much additional uh, each company is getting. Um, and uh, they are very appreciative of all of this also. So I uh, just wanted to bring that up. And like I said, next month, you'll have that in, uh, spreadsheet incorporated in my report sent to you. Uh, Mr. Lynch, can you give us a, a sort of update? I mean, you and I spoke about what's going on at high schools. Yeah, so the week of September 20th, um, actually Monday the 20th through Thursday the 23rd, um, the fire company uh, was at the high school every day for a malicious false alarm. Um, between the four days, it involved 10 scholars and uh, working with uh, Vice Principal Dr. Hammond, uh, the 10 students or 10 scholars that were involved were all suspended and uh, the parents received uh, citations from me um, for the malicious false alarm to start holding you know, more people accountable because uh, we, again, we're volunteer fire guys and we're leaving work and everything like that. Um, I will say that one of the incidents at the high school was a TikTok dare and uh, the person was dared to pull the fire alarm. He pulled the fire alarm and turned around and smiled pretty for us on the camera. So um, Dr. Hammond, at the, like I said, the vice principal at the high school um, uh, is, uh, doesn't care for this too much. And uh, he, um, he's making sure that there's consequences for the, the scholars' actions. Can you tell me how much these citations are when this happens? What's, how much is it? Uh, it ranges between $350 to $1,000. 
Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Any other questions? Yes, Commissioner mm -hmm. Armin. Uh, thank you. Uh, Fire Marshal Lynch, um, you, you sort of touched on it. This is this um, the, the citations and the penalty is not um, not only um, punitive and, and rehabilitative, but um, it's reimbursement for um, costs that are incurred by the responding fire company. Can you talk a little bit about that? You touched on the fact that you know people had to leave work because they're volunteers, but can you touch on you know, what are some of the costs that are incurred when um, a fire company has to respond to a false alarm? Yeah, you're looking at lost wages for the volunteers. You're looking at the wear and tear on the apparatus, fuel costs, um, things like that. Um, so that that's why with the, you know, the citations, um, we're giving some of that back to the fire companies. Uh, you know, and it, it, it also, it also increases the risk of an accident, um, firefighter injury. Um, I'm living proof of that, but um, you know, there's it, the list goes on and on. You know, now understand. Uh, since that week in September, we've been to the high school for uh, calls. Um, one was a just a smoke detector in the classroom that completely malfunctioned and went off, and another one was uh, burnt food in the kitchen where the, the system activated, it did its job. It detected smoke and it went off. So uh, there are legitimate calls there. Sure. Okay, thanks for elaborating. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Rappaport. Thank you. And, and this is on a different subject. Um, in your report, um, I noticed that there were a lot of calls. Uh, if you add them together, uh, about a hundred calls for um, both electrical fires, outside electrical fires, and inside and outside um, smell of gas. Um, I don't remember the numbers looking like that in the past, although I may be wrong. And um, I'm just wondering, were those verified, were most of them verified, and can you, it doesn't seem normal of, in this township and also in comparison to other townships, or could it be related to any of the work that's being done, any of the uh, you know gas and electric repairs that are being done? What what do you think is that normal? So a lot of the throughout the township they're replacing the older gas lines um, and water line water main replacements, things like that. The utilities go out and do the best they can to mark where each other's piping and wiring is, and sometimes they're off contractors do digging up the street strike a gas line so that's a lot of the gas odors outside <coughs> excuse me um the electrical fires outside you'd be surprised with the wind and the, the rain and all how many we get and a lot of and some of those are repeat where you know we will go we'll secure the area we'll notify pico and move on to the next call and 20 minutes later somebody else will call for the same location so you know we try and educate the uh, residents, they don't go in there, don't go near the area, and Pico's aware of it. There's nothing we can do with this right now, uh, and uh, go on. But uh, you know, if it's a if it's a stormy year, you know, we're going to have a lot more electrical fire calls. Uh, so, you, uh, what but you are saying that this is within the normal realm? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions for commissioners for our fire marshal? Seeing none, I call the question that the uh, report for the fire marshal for the month of August 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Fire Marshal Lynch. Yes. Take care. You, take care of that boo boo. Um, we're going to move forward now to report from the emergency <laughs> medical service director, uh, Mr. Um, Hillendahl. Good evening, all. Um, just a couple things for EMS. Um, good news, all good news. Um, the ambulance was finally picked up. The new chassis is available, and it the replacement should be back in January, barring any other shortages. Um, we're about six six months behind schedule uh, due to chip shortages. Um, thanks to some hard work by the manager, um, we hope to have. 
two replacements on board by November 1. Um, I just want to mention that the staff has been outstanding doing 24 hours straight, coming back in the next day and doing another 12 during our staffing shortage. We're still down a couple, but this will really help a lot. So thank you. Um, lastly, as you know, from last year, this will be the first year that our new billing company is doing our membership drive. Um, and we have started working on that with them. Um, during the month, um, you will get to see an example before it goes out. Um, what I've seen so far is really impressive. So I think our residents will be happy with it. That's all I have for EMS. Commissioner Norris, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you. Uh, Ken, just a question. You mentioned the billing. Uh, yes, sir. I'm, look, I'm looking at the billing page. Um, am I saying it correct that, that billings year to date are down quite a bit from last year? Um, that's because it has not caught up yet with the um, the money that we mentioned last month was in a wrong account that's running two months behind. So that should be caught up by next month. Um, that okay. was discovered um, in the first, I guess the second quarter of the year, the money was found and it's being transferred. So that should be updated by next month because these reports are two months behind. Okay. Correct. Thank you. The month, it's posted as of October 1st. So you'll see it in the following month's report. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ken, we'll move on to your next report on the emergency management and then we'll sort of approve both. Certainly. Um, first of all, a giant thank you to police, public works, EMS, and the fire department. Um, I don't think I have ever gotten so many thank you notes and compliments as we did from across the county. Uh, I'm not gonna reiterate since um, the board has already received a letter detailing what we did and there's more in the report. Um, the police responded to Upper Dublin instantly. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of them couldn't get there. Um, I've been, next year will be 50 years doing this for me and I've never seen damage like I saw in Upper Dublin. Um, it was, it's some of you I know have been there if you haven't. Um, um, I, I came back after the first day. Uh, we had a couple streets that flooded and some, a couple of vehicle rescues. Um, and uh, it was just amazing. Um, you, the um, letter that Lieutenant Slavin showed, we got that also, which was forwarded. Um, thank you to Bob for making the staff available. Um, I can tell you that um, we sent, I think it was um, five public works guys to Upper Providence, and they all came back humble. There were um, five big, strong guys, and I talked to them when they got back, and they said, we went down the street, and we picked up people's belongings, and we went back an hour later, and we picked up the rest of their belongings. Um, it was unbelievable. Um, 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 all of us as a team should be proud not just me, but everybody, um, all the work paid off. I can tell you, you've heard me mention multiple times the Eastern Montgomery County group. Um, that group did a fantastic job, including our people. Um, somebody told us a long time ago, you have to get to know people before the disaster, not during it. And it was great that all egos and badges were checked at the door and everybody just got along and worked. Um, our big blue rescue truck um, made three rescues in Cheltenham and about 250 across the county. Um, and so um, it was very well received. The other good news is that the radio system that you've heard nothing good about for, I don't know how many years, performed beautifully. There was not one problem. Um, and there, it was uh, with all the disasters that went on that day, it was at 35% of capacity. Uh, the old system they told us at a meeting yesterday would have been at 140% and it crashes at 90%. So um, big step up, took a long time, but it worked really, really well. Um, 
we are working um, the, the budget or possible grant money for storm damage was just approved for municipalities. Um, and we're looking into that now. Um, we only received calls from about 12 residents during the storm who wanted to put in for damage. Some did not qualify. We spoke to all of them and they were referred to the county. Um, and I think uh, that is it about the storm. Um, obviously been working on COVID during the month. Um, and we're also trying to get another sign board for the township and a light tower um, from the county. Um, that's all I have. Happy to answer questions. Any questions for Ken? Mitch, did I see you right, right John? No? Rare, a rare occurrence, I did not. <laughs> all right, then I'm gonna move forward, calling for the call to question item two and three um, for our report tonight. I'm well, sorry, three and four. I mean, that would be three and four, medical service and management coordinator. Yes, all those in favor of accepting the reports, number three and four from EMS and emergency management, say aye. 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 Great, we're going to move on now to any old business for public safety. If I Commissioner may. Arment. Commissioner Th Arment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. J just a quick announcement for the public. Um, the Lime Kiln Pike Bridge, which hopefully will be completed soon, uh, is anticipated to have a couple of evening closures starting next week between the uh, starting Monday and ending Friday. It may be two or three evening only closures. So uh, be guided accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Any other items for old business? Seeing none, we're going to move on. Any new business for public safety? No new business. We'll move on to item seven, which is Citizens Forum for Public Safety. Um, Allison, can you open it up? Um, I did see that Liza uh, did make a comment in the chat, and we'll have Liza go first in reference to, she said, the finding of children. Um, Liza? Hi, how are you? Thanks so much. Hey, Liza, how are you? Um, yeah, I, I did want to talk about the finding of children for the pulling of fire alarms. Um, certainly, that's very irritating, right? I'm a teacher, and I know how it feels to be irritated by children's behavior, you know, and you kind of want to strangle them sometimes, especially when they turn around and smile at the camera. Um, that is certainly crazy. Um, and I, I think that it justifies being angry enough to want to punish them or to hold their parents accountable. But I also want us to pause and remember that our children have been through a really traumatic situation with the global pandemic, that they spent a year and a half at home in isolation. We know full well that this is causing mental health issues, that these mental health issues may not be being addressed. Um, and mental health issues, especially in children, they don't just come to school and cry and ask for attention. This is kind of what it looks like. Right. They make really strange decisions that are antisocial and you can't understand it. And this is them and their childlike brain, you know, calling out for attention in all the wrong ways. You know, so I'm not saying that their behavior is not wrong, but I, I do want us to just pause. And remember, they just went back to school, you know, and they're going back to normalizing. And it's hard to go from being at home for a year and a half to being in a really regimented um, sort of situation where you move every 45 minutes, you sit where they tell you to sit, you're very controlled all day long. Um, and that's, that's a big change. And I also have to ask, you know, I agree it may cost us money to be going there, especially if it's every day, but finding them 350 to a thousand dollars, I know some of them got a thousand dollar fines. Did it really cost us that much? You know, was it really a thousand dollars? And I want to point out that like a couple years back, a study came out that said that most, or it was like half of Americans couldn't afford a surprise $400 bill. So like for a lot of families, if they suddenly have a fine of $1,000, like that can really affect their budget, you know? And are we just using our frustration to sort of justify forcible subsidizing and taking these fines? And is there something else we can do to pay them? Like I know that the schools have received millions of dollars in ESSER funds to, to address some of the COVID effects 
And this is certainly a COVID effect, right? The children are destroying things. It's not really because of TikTok, because social media was around before, and it's not because the kids are bad or the parents are bad. This is like a nationwide problem that kids are struggling coming back. Um, so I just want us to like, I want to kind of bring us back to that, that these kids are really struggling. Um, and I, I don't think that we want to, you know, hurt them. I think that maybe we can find other ways to, to mitigate that situation. Thank you. Thank you, Liza. Thank you. Any other, I see some hands up. I see Jonathan and then we'll go to, to Mika. Jonathan. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Um, I haven't you, been in a public safety meeting, so this is very interesting and very informative. And I appreciate all the efforts of uh, the public safety infrastructure in, in protecting our community. I have um, four items that I wanted to address today. I'm in a ward two and um, on Old Farm Road, I have one of my one of my uh, neighbors on here. You see him as Salem Baptist Church on there. And uh, we have collectively, we have some concerns that are that are occurring in our area. First of all, it, the donuts that are occurring in Cheltenham High School parking lot. I'm sure uh, Lieutenant Slavin has gotten and his department has gotten many, many calls about donuts happening in our happening in this in this uh, parking lot. And um, not only is it just disturbing the peace and disturbing our disturbing residents and killing the calm that we have had over here, you know, before the pandemic, it was happening maybe once every month or every couple of months, but the pandemic has really heightened the uh, frequency of, of folks coming. So for instance, instead of the couple times a month, last week, six times, six times, we had people in the, in the parking lot doing donuts. And for, you know, when it's at 12.50 at night or whether it's 9.50 at night or at some odd hour, it is very disturbing. We have folks who have health issues. You know, you know the, I don't have to recount all of that. So I understand that as the police, police infrastructure, you cannot sit there every night, all night, looking for people doing donuts. Completely recognize that. Um, so I wanted to propose a couple of things, and I hope that I'll be able to submit this. This I have a document that I could submit to this committee outlining some of maybe some potential recommendations. Um, one, we just heard about fines for children and, you know, whether that's debatable. I do not think it's debatable that these these people who are doing donuts and are continuing and are finding our parking lot to do donuts get imposed some serious fines. Five hundred to a thousand dollars is I think it's reasonable. So as a deterrent to get to, st to stop some of this activity or post warning and the post warning signs of fines. This may require a regulatory change. I don't know if we need to do something in the code, but I think it's I think it's reasonable. Second, install some speed humps. I recognize that, that costs money. Maybe it's grant dollars. Maybe we have uh, corporate dollars that we can use. And maybe it's, and 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 the idea is maybe we have one of these local universities that can do some modeling, model where our speed humps go, so we're not just throwing them all over the place. It's not going to stop the activities that are happening right now with buses, with people learning how to drive on there, with kids playing out there, with the band playing out there. None of these activities activities would be disturbed. Um, put up poles. In other, in other uh, parking lots, in, particularly in Philly and, and throughout other areas, we have poles and chains. I'm not advocating having that forever, but perhaps it can stop the influx of these folks for and, and do it for a year and then revisit it to see if we have stopped people from coming to this, to this uh, parking lot. And, to, and, and, and when there's official use that is, that is occurring, to have somebody who is the holder of the keys or a couple folks who are the holder of the keys, Come and open it when it's time for school. Open it when the when you have events over there. Open it when the football team, when there's a football game. But to really start curbing the activity um, by putting up some some uh, putting up these chains and poles. Um, and fourth, perhaps add some substance to the parking lot. Maybe it's a sand. Maybe it's some other substance that these folks would not want to be skidding their tires on. That would be ruining their ruining the, the underside of their cars. Again, not to disturb any of the activities that are going on there now, but to be able to de again serve as a deterrent to some of these to some of these people. This is a this is a, it, it sounds like it's just a nuisance issue, but it is a nuisance issue that has increased in intensity astronomically over the last year and a half. 
That was issue one. Issue two, three, and four are, are quick. I think uh, Lieutenant Slavin talked a little bit about the excessive speed on Rice's Mill Road. Um, so some of the portable signs are, are helpful. I see people slowing down. I'm walking on that street every day. It's right, out, it's right at the corner. Um, perhaps we can start doing a traffic calming study. I don't think speed humps would be terrible because folks are coming down this road at 60 miles per hour on, on odd and off hours. It is, it's detrimental. We have all these kids walking up and down, this, down the street. It is, a, it is a true public safety hazard. Issue three is speeding buses on Old Farm Road. We'd ask that you speak to the bus drivers so that they don't come ripping down the road off of Old Mill down Old Farm Road at 30 miles per hour when we have cars parked. We have kids out here. There are a bunch of children on the street. It is just a hazard. And there's really, they're not getting anywhere faster coming down our street at 40 miles per hour to get to the corner than if they were at 25 or 20 miles per hour. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. And my fourth issue is there has been, uh, with, with there's for the last couple of months, a car carrier pickup. I don't know how else to call it. But there is a car carrier that's been parked in Old Mill Road. From what I understand from one of the, uh, a former truck driver on our block, uh, that is a class three vehicle, it should not be there. It is parked right now on Old, Farm, on, um, Old Mill Road. And um, we don't want to encourage others because this looks like free, free street, this is free parking, it's open, there's no one out there. We do not want to encourage additional parking um, on that street of that type of vehicle. Again, it mars the neighborhood. It creates a, it creates a bad atmosphere for where we are. We are in, in historic wind coat and our, the residents in this area would like to keep it wet that way. So just thank you for the time. Appreciate it, Commissioner, and I will uh, finish my right. comments there. All right, Jonathan, thank you very much for your, your list there. So I'm gonna take your list. I'm gonna sort of work backwards. Yes. The car carrier, um, Lieutenant Slavin's on his call. He will probably note that, and that will be looked at tomorrow. Great. Absolutely. So we will look at that. Yeah, that will be looked at immediately. Okay. So I'm going to go with that. Um, the speeding buses, um, what we have to do, that's a school board, a school issue. Okay. All right. Now, we do meet uh, with the school board, um, not with the whole board, but we do have a meeting um, with, with some of the members, and we can bring that up. But again, we need to touch base with the school in reference to the school bus drivers. Okay. So, and, but, you know, we'll work with you on that um, to make sure that happens. Excellent. Okay. Um, also with this uh, speeding on Rice's Mills, um, that road is, is, it's a township road. So again, Lieutenant Slavin, um, you know, you, you hear the call from our residents. I'm going to ask you to pick that up. Yes, sir, Commissioner. Sure that we do some type of monitoring there. Um, Jonathan, I will ask you, are you seeing at any particular time of the day? Is it a, a morning rush hour, evening, or is it just sort of any time of the day, would you say? In the morning, as, as Lieutenant Slavin mentioned, it's, it's, there's a glut. The school's there. People, are, people come down the street. They may speed down the first half of the street, but then mm -hmm. they're stopped at the second half toward Wincote Elementary. But during the day, um, or even when I'm walking to pick up my son at about at about 3:20, they are hustling down the street at 50 and 60 miles per hour. Regularly. And I would think by that that time the school blinking light should be on. It's, I would think the 15 mile an hour for school blinking should be on on Rice's Mills. Sometimes, sometimes it's working. Most of the time it's working. But as soon as that light goes off, it is um, it tells bells out there. They are really, really hustling. Okay. And All right. 60, well, is, 60 is a conservative number for many of the folks who are driving down there. Okay. So we may have to put some type of speed study out there, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. So this way we can kind of take a look and see what, what's going on there. Yes, sir. We can go at that a couple of different ways. Yes. Okay. And then in reference to the donuts in the parking lot, again, that we have to bring that up to the school board. Um, that's sort of, that, that's their property. Um, it is frustrating, I'm sure, mm -hmm. if you're getting that many. Um, six, you said six times last month. Last week. Um, 
last week. I'm sorry, last I put month. Is last in a week, week six times, and, and we've is called this, twice, I think. All right. So we need to. Is there a particular time again when you were? Is it just the weekends? Is it? No, no. When I say six times, I'm saying on Wednesday, on mm -hmm. a Monday. So it used to be just on a Saturday, and we could take that. You know, residents can take that. We understand they're out there. Folks want to. No, you, you shouldn't even have to take it then. I yeah. You but this is during the week. This is literally right. on a Wednesday at mm -hmm. twelve fifty at night. Right. And then I think nine fifty at night on the same night last Wednesday. Same thing. So it was six times last week, not in a mm -hmm. month, in a week. Have you ever have you spoken with anyone at the school about no, that? No, I have not. In fact, okay. um, my, uh, myself and our and then my neighbors, and, and which you see Bruce there, Salem Baptist Baptist Church. Yeah, yeah I know Bruce. Spoke, we yeah, I'm sure you know. We spoke. Um, we you know as we we communicate all the time in the streets. A very tight knit street. And we all spoke and I said, you know what? I see public safety on the calendar. I'm going to go to the meeting. And everybody said, yes, that makes sense. And so I'm no, not I'm just representing me. I'm mm -hmm. representing at least five households oh, on this block. I, I'm sure you are. Mm -hmm. And we hear you. And I'm glad Lieutenant Slavin's here to hear that issue. Um, this is a major issue in our township and we have to address it. And something like, you know, this is, can be corrected in my opinion. Mm -hmm. This can be corrected with the proper police work. This can Mr. be corrected. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, Township Manager. Uh, last month in our school liaison meeting, we did let the school district know about their buses okay. speeding. Um, I know that we have also informed them because we've actually had our public works director take video of the school buses speeding through the school zones. So we have uh, pushed that along to the school district. Uh, so we are aware of that issue. Uh, and again, I think it's good that you've, you've brought this up because we will correspond with the school district tomorrow since it's a contracted bus service that they need to take um, action upon that. But also too, Lieutenant Slavin knows that the police are directed to ticket those buses. There's no free passes on those, especially when they speed through school zones uh, and through red lights, that's not acceptable. So the police do know they are they have the ability to go and cite that, cite those individuals on that. The last thing I can do is just encourage anybody. If you hear the vehicles spitting out or doing that, please dial 911. Yeah. It's not an issue. It's not a problem. It helps document that, but also gets police moving in that direction. Uh, so that even if, you know, whatever vehicles are, if someone says, hey, it's a a black Dodge Charger, it's a red Dodge Charger, it, it's an orange, you know, whatever type of car it is. They know that as they're heading that direction, if they see somebody going, they can actually pick up on that. Yeah. Yeah, because I know, I think you said that it was six times, but you didn't call all six times. No, so, um, I think you just got, no, I did not call all six times. Sometimes my wife is up and I'm asleep and she says, did you hear the spinning wheels? I said, no, sometimes she's in the basement, I'm upstairs. Okay. Did gotcha. you hear the spinning wheels? And you, so it works that way. And we, frankly, I, I'm concerned because if I'm calling 911 on people doing donuts and somebody else is doing something else nefarious in the township, how are we taking resources? Now I understand it's a nuisance for us, but I'm not trying to take resources for other, other important things. So when they're out here for more than about a minute or two, then we call, or when it's 1250 at night, then we're calling. But gotcha. it's happening with more frequency. In fact, I think a chat came in, uh, my wife put in about the frequency last week of the of these donut incidents. Okay. And, ple and please, please do not hesitate to call. Take the call. I, think, I think you have to call. We will. That's the only way we're going to be able to reduce it. Mm -hmm. to reduce it, it helps it. set a record too, like the commissioner saying, it helps us document, okay, these calls are coming in. It helps tracking where it's at. It's never a problem for anyone to call 911. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Please do and so. If, and if there's an issue, just say the township manager said the call. And I'll tell you. Yeah. If I could echo the, the manager, I agree with the manager's uh, statements on that as well. It also helps us with deployment efforts as well. So we know where our problem is. We can put resources to that. Please don't hesitate to call. That's what we're here for. The peace and order in the township is very important to us, and we will take action on this. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. but, Thank you. Mr. Chair. Commissioner, one second. Commissioner Armin. I okay, that, yeah. just very briefly to, to sort of touch on the, the bus issue. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad it's going to get raised again at the liaison meeting, but but I appreciate 
Uh, Manager Zienkowski mentioning that it's going to be raised again tomorrow. I think that is appropriate uh, with the contracted bus service. Um, Lieutenant Slavin, the, the, the depot, as you know, is at the end of Brook Road. Uh, and uh, that is a prime spot to identify uh, our worst Cheltenham trans offenders because they are moving when they come down Brook Road to get uh, just a point of point of contact there. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. Thank you. Someone else had a comment on this? Yes. Yes, go forward. Good evening again. My name is Bruce Johnston. Hey, Bruce. Hi. And I'm glad, excuse me, that's my dog, excuse me, uh, scared me. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm able to be on this call. Um, the parking lot is an interesting um, place. It, it, it seems like um, at times we see things going on and on in the parking lot that should not be going on. And we have um, brought this up to uh, a number of police officers and they have uh, addressed the situation on occasion they can't, again, as Jonathan mentioned, they can't sit in the parking lot all day or all night. But what, what's happening is you, we have a number of cars who are parking in, in the in the parking lot next to the bush area in the back where there's no lights and it's real dark. And I don't know what they're doing in those, in those cars. The reason why I know is because I typically walk my dog 9, 9.30 at night and I see that going on. Um, so I think that needs to be addressed. I think, and I, I know it's a school issue, but I think we need to put lights back there to deter individuals from parking there, thinking that they're getting away with something by parking their car in the dark part of the parking lot itself. That's number Thank one. Mm -hmm. Number two is um, on Longfellow and Old Mill. If you come straight down Longfellow, um, a lot of people, especially in the morning, there's a do not enter two do not enter signs on Longfellow. So you will have to come down Longfellow and make a right to go down Old Farm and that will drop you off in the Rice's Mill. But what people are doing is they're going right through the two do not enter signs to get to Old Mill to make the left so they can use their wraparound to get uh, up to um, close to 309. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know it's probably been going on for years, but it's it's, it's frustrating because you, you have kids out there waiting on buses. Um, you have kids walking. Um, and, you know, at times they don't even slow down. They'll just keep going like, like they don't even see it. They won't even slow down first and then kind of creep through it. I used to see that from time to time. Now I'm just seeing people just going through it. All right. Thank you very much. And, and, and one you. last thing. One okay, last, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Bruce. One last thing. Sorry. Um, also, I don't know if there's drug-free school zones. I don't, first of all, I don't even know if that's just for the Philadelphia area or that happens in this township or outside of Philadelphia. But I think there needs to be signs up there for drug-free school zones. Why? And the reason why is because in the mornings, we've seen a number of kids walking down our block specifically who are smoking marijuana as they're going to school. While, you know, while small children are waiting for the bus or buses. All right, thank you. So noted, and again, our lieutenant's on there. He's making notes, I'm making notes. So thank you very, very much. Okay. Well, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, so we're going to move on now. And um, Mika? Hi, I'm Joe Augustine. I'm actually Mika's husband. Yes. Hey, Hi, how are you, sir? Um, Mika's here. Um, so uh, I came to chat a little bit about, I know this has been an ongoing topic and there's been a lot of emotional frustration with it, but um, uh, I want to kind of just focus on maybe some facts. Uh, I'm an architect, I work with developers, so I'm 
a little bit familiar with, you know, PennDOT requirements for site distances and uh, data like that. Um, I want to speak specifically about us attempting to egress our driveway onto Greenwood Avenue. Posted speed limit is 25 miles per hour. It takes approximately four seconds to leave the driveway and be fully occupied in the lane. So as if you were rear-ended, it's not your fault. You have possession of the lane. So that's four seconds. The sight line from our driveway to the right towards the bridge is 125 feet plus or minus. And that's the same sight line from the bridge back to our driveway. So going to PennDOT's website, they have criteria for what sight triangle should be for different mile per hour roads. And for a 25 mile per hour road, they want 150 feet, which were Um, I looked at the data, you know, 30 miles per hour to 201 feet, 35 miles per hour, 256. We have cars traveling 45, 50 miles per hour, which is 400 to 480 feet of stopping distance that would, uh, would be required. Um, at four seconds, so if you go back to that four second number, at 25 miles per hour, a car is traveling roughly... 37 you know, feet per second. So if they're paying attention, if they're not distracted, and they only have four seconds to react to us leaving the driveway. And you know, I, I've heard a lot of things, well, you know, it's a county road, it's a state road, it's not a township road, that's fine. I, I think the solution is the speed limit needs to be enforced. I think 25 mile per hour is an appropriate speed limit. And there was, discussions on introducing a stop sign at Hedgerow, um, that may help. Um, I think part of it is we get a lot of uh, heavy semi-vehicular traffic on our street. And um, uh, I know the trucks are trying to you know, gain momentum coming down the hill. The bridge is the bottom of the valley and then they wanna you know, make it up the hill. So they're actually accelerating both directions coming down the hill. So, um, uh, I don't think you're going to get semi trucks off of Greenwood Avenue, even. Is enforcement, strict enforcement to be done because there was just an accident in front of our house Sunday afternoon. Um, Officer Floon responded to it. It was a two car accident. Uh, driver A lost control of his vehicle as he was going over the bridge, struck the wall in front of our house cause in the second vehicle, they hit him head on. He had to be extracted from his vehicle. So um, we've lived here for almost 25 years and we've witnessed serious accidents, you know, throughout that time. And I think the only time we didn't witness accidents is when the bridge was under construction. And it was actually quite a, you know, reprieve to have a, a dead end street for six to nine months. Okay, are you are you completed? Are you done? Because yes. I, I, okay, I'm sorry. Um, my Perfect. audio was is, is a little broken up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do want to. Okay, uh, Commissioner Rappaport, one second. I do want to yeah. speak to Lieutenant um, Slavin real quick with the speed limit issue and enforcing it. Um, is it still where if someone has to go ten miles over the stated speed limit in order for that person to be ticketed. If someone's going 28 or 30 miles an hour in that zone, can they get a ticket or do they need to go 35? Usually it's when we give them the 10 mile an hour cushion over that. Usually there is a cushion involved in that. Uh, but that's something we can look at for sure. Um, but you know stopping these cars, letting people know what their speed is, using education, using their three prong approach to get that information out there, I think is also crucial enforcement and in educating as well with the speed signs and that stuff to let the residents know what they're doing or, or the uh, motor and public know their speeds there can be helpful as well. In addition so, to the enforcement end. So you are allowed to give someone a ticket if they're, if they're going 30 miles in a 25 zone, are you allowed to ticket someone? Yes, yeah, so you could take them over to speed. Usually we give them the 10 mile an hour cushion in there. There is a building to the cushion in there. 
Um, but yes, in the problem location like that, we would certainly consider that, sir. We're, we're trying to address this. We're trying to slow motors down here. If that's what it takes, that's what we're going to have to do. We'll look at that. Okay. Commissioner Rappaport. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, the whole issue of site distance uh, for uh, driveways, private driveways along these roads, that was one of the issues that I found lacking. And I, I did uh, make a note of this to our, uh, our um, manager, um, that that was one of the problems in the proposed PennDOT truck study or the study, the road study, um, because they talked about inter uh, intersections, I guess, but not uh, the driveways. And I think that was a problem. I, it, it is continuing to be a, an increasing problem because of the fact that these are resident, special residential areas along the state roads and they're not getting adequate attention. Those, many of those driveways, most of those driveways preceded the kind of traffic conditions and the kinds of speeds that we're seeing today. PennDOT is not, it presumably says in their literature that they would take uh, consideration of special um, environments and special uh, uh, circumstances. These are those circumstances. When you have residential zones and the people who are living on that road cannot get out of their driveways safely, um, that needs to be taken into account. So I appreciate you doing the measurements for us, Mr. Augustine. Um, and, and again, I reiterate that needs to be part of what we're studying on these roads for the safety of our residents. Right, and if I may just reiterate the, it's actually a worksheet on PennDOT's website that developers and traffic engineers have to utilize when they're proposing the development to conform with. So it's a recognized concern and need presented by PennDOT but they need to apply in a reciprocal manner to what exactly. they're at, uh, as they're evaluating speed limits. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. Um, sir, just to let you know, uh, we have requested the district director of PennDOT to include your area in their study. So we're just awaiting uh, the response back from them. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Holland. Yep, yeah, re really quickly. So I was I was going to add that comment that uh, the township manager just added. In addition, um, a couple of updates that were recently completed. Uh, so Lieutenant Slavin has coordinated for an unmanned police vehicle uh, to be um, utilized. It's actually there now um, on Church Road, and and that vehicle will be rotated to different spots to hopefully deter. Uh, speeders. It will be unmanned, but it will be visible uh, from the street and hopefully slow slow folks down in that area. Um, and in addition, um, we have the speed signs. I, I, I don't know if they're there yet, John, or not, but we um, have committed to getting those two speed signs on Greenwood. Is that correct? That's correct, Commissioner. We're going to do this as a multi-pronged approach, using the unmarked vehicle, using the speed radar signs as well, and using offer presence there as well. So a three prong approach right off the bat to try to immediately address this. Right. So that that is that is at least a start. And you know, obviously that's focused on Greenwood Avenue. You know, if we, you know, see what type of impact that we have there, you know, if we if we see and we think we need to move that to Rice's Mill or some other area, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that you know general vicinity, you know, I, I think we can do that on a rotating basis. Um, but let's let's use this as a test and, and see what type of impact that this makes. Mr. We are moving that around. We had it on uh, off the church road today. So you are moving to different locations to try to get it out there to slow traffic down. Great, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move forward. Um, I'm gonna say Emily. And then Allie and then Kimberly. Hey everybody. Um, it's good to hear everybody um, weighing in tonight and hearing some new voices weighing in on particularly the donuts. Um, 
in the parking lot of the school. That was really impressive to hear you guys talking about that. It's getting worse and worse. And so it's nice to hear um, that we are gonna be getting some people kind of looking into this. My question is, don't we pay, we pay school taxes, correct? I'm sorry, yes, you do. Yes, you okay, do. so are they, is the school responsible for um, policing the parking lot? No, I would say no. Okay. Uh, Ms. Laven, am I correct with that? That's correct, sir. That would fall up within our preview there, sir. I think any so kind of improvements that, that Jonathan mentioned earlier, there are very good suggestions. Those type of things would be the school district making it to the their property. Yes, just right. to clarify that. Okay, but for policing the area, it comes down to the Cheltenham police, correct? Correct. Okay, so I think that regular patrols there would be really, really helpful um, to help with this problem because it is getting out of control um, to the point where we all have to keep our windows closed at night because we kind of live on it. It's like living on the Indy 500. I think um, you will. I think you will see a difference. I, I trust Lieutenant Slavin, and I think you guys will see a difference. We're I hoping so. I believe so. You will. Okay. Second point is um, regarding the accident in front of Mika and Joe's house this week. Um, we just got an, a huge letter from PennDOT basically telling us that, that there is no, um, they're not thinking of ever taking trucks off of Church or Greenwood Avenue. And um, I think we really, as a community need to look at, we can't just take that as an answer. I think we actually need to go forward with more uh, questioning about how PennDOT is dealing with Church and Greenwood uh, in terms of traffic and in terms of trucks. And I don't think that the letter they sent out to us was um, answered any questions actually. They just kind of shut us down. So that's just what I, I want to go on record saying that. And I think it would be really good if we had another discussion on the PennDOT responses uh, to our questions to them. All right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna to go to Allie. Hello, um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be able to and humbled to listening to all the good work all of you are doing and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, a very special thank you to, to Commissioner Zygmunt Felt who've heard, who's, who've heard, who has heard, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous and embraced my concerns for three years running. So I just really appreciate um, your continued empathy, your continued, um, responsiveness and so thank you it's more it's more than um, I could ask for and you get my emotional side so thank you for dealing with that too um, I am speaking uh, tonight on behalf of um, some of my neighbors who are here tonight and then some who couldn't make it um, there's about 10 of us total um, and because I was a little nervous and this feels high stakes for me because um, this now is kind of interfering with our mental health, I'd love to be able to share my screen. I have a little presentation. It's short, I promise, but it helps me compose my thoughts. If I could uh, have screen sharing privileges, that would be fabulous. I'm not sure about that, Allie, because we have no idea what you're showing me. Oh, it's um, just a PowerPoint that outlines like the things I'm talking about. Sorry, I should have sent it to you ahead of time. Yeah, you should have sent it to us ahead of time when you're going to do something like that. I, you know, I would feel more comfortable okay. if, if it was already sent to us. Okay, I can I can send it to you afterwards and I'll just kind of talk through it. Ali, why okay. don't you summarize it and then you have my support to reinforce those. I mean, Commissioner um, Zignafel, are you would you be okay with her sharing this? You would know. I would more. because I've, I've had three years of nothing but... Uh, appropriate concern and behavior. So I have no question about okay. what she's doing. She's just gonna show uh, the amount of noise and, and problems that have occurred as a result of the <laughs> local community having to uh, endure some of the things that happened on the so five. Uh, oh, this soccer. is so five. Oh, so okay. this is, this so, this is so five issue, Commissioner uh, Brocking. Okay. If you hear any background okay. noise, they're just joining us for tonight's call. So. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
Okay, Ashley, can you allow her to share? Allison has stepped away Allison. for a brief moment. So okay, so so Allie, you got to wing it. You got to wing. Okay, it. woo! I'm not used to winging it. Um, uh, okay. So um, some of the things I do want to share with you too are video clips um, and Commissioner Zygmuntfeld has seen all of these as well. So this is, this is nothing new, but again, I wanted to kind of surface all of your support as we think about next steps with the, this issue, knowing that, you know, um, Commissioner Zygmuntfeld has been there with us, supporting us, advocating for us this whole time as well. Um, but like some concerns that Jonathan and Emily have brought up, things on our side um, have gotten really much worse recently. I have a video clip of donuts in the parking lot. You may hear some on this call as well. Uh, things are just, you can hear the cars right now. Um, things are just getting getting harder. And so what uh, my neighbors and I have been doing is we've been looking back at some of the zoning restrictions and what we've noticed is there's a big discrepancy between what was happening previously with the the regulations with the tennis court and then what happened with SoFi, which makes sense. They're two different organizations, two different companies. Um, but from my limited um, litigious knowledge, if, if that's a word, um, it seems like some of the things that uh, the terms of use that they agreed upon, including clauses about light and sound barriers, um, no amplified noise uh, have been continued to be broken. And that's it, really impacting our community. I have a little screenshot of that, that zoning law here, but you're, you can't see it right now. So I'm asking for your help. We need your help. The big four issues that we are um, dealing with right now, I mean, the biggest one is noise. You may or may not be able to hear it right now, but just as we settle down, we put our t two kindergartners, our three-year-old down um, to sleep. I live on uh, Jenkintown Road, Jenkintown and Church. So it's a right next to the Elkins Park Medical uh, Center. Emily, I saw your, uh, your question there. Um, just as we settle down and our kids get to bed, that is when this noise just roars through our house, our windows, with with uh, into our home, beyond in our yard, um, and it's it's really interfering with lots of different things. Um, and right now, the the permit allows them to go until 10 p.m., and that is happening every single night of the week. And they often start early in the morning on weekends. And then during the weekdays, they usually start around 12, and then incrementally it gets it gets lo uh, louder and louder across the night. And it ends in screamings and swearing and yelling and whistles, sometimes in music. And then it ends with parking lot parties, usually from, I say parties, right, um, from 10 to 11 p.m. Most of the nights I do call the staff. I always call cell five first, always. The staff has now... Um, they hear me. They understand. I have, I have some quotes to share with you that they have, they have, um, we that we've, I've collected over the last week or so, and they see this as an area of concern as well. Um, another issue is that there's no oversight in the parking lot until I believe Tuesday. Is that right, Commissioner? <laughs> that that would out? be correct. There was Tuesday a Tuesday uh... was a great night, right? <laughs> so. At 10 o'clock, um, 10 to 10, 15, people were out of the parking lot. That made a huge difference. But until then, three years, this has been promised from SoFi that they would have um, parking lot enforcement. This has not happened until Tuesday. So my hope is that that parking lot issues will be minimized, but still until 10 o'clock at night, having three young children working right here and teaching at night, having those noise disruptions, um, it's interfering with a lot of, a lot of life. Um, there's also light disturbance. Those lights shine right into our home. I have a picture of that to share with you, with I, which I can send later. Um, and that is really, uh, that in the zoning issue, it talks about A, B, C, and D with light mitigation, and none of those things are being followed. So it, this is interfering with our lives in many, many different ways. It's also the pandemic. They have not, they've been cited for not following pandemic uh, COVID regulations prior to, you know, this, this fall. But even having a friend over in the in the neighbor in the yard, um, I can't do that because of the noise. So this is impacting our lives in many, many, many different ways. So I'm going to the next slide here. I really need this. Um, I don't Allie, know if Allie, you, if you want to. Oh, what was that? Go ahead, go ahead and use. Oh, can I go ahead and share? Okay, yes. thank you so much. And I promise I will not take up too much of your time here. All right, so I just want you just to, for a moment, imagine that this is you're settling down for the evening, and this is what you hear. Can you hear this? Yes. Probably depends on your computer sound. 
All right, so that was not a great one, but as Mish knows, I got many, many more. But I'm just gonna show you a few, 30 more seconds of these or so, just to get a taste of kind of what our, our evening from 7.30 till 10 or 11 looks like every single night. So this is after hours noise. This is in the parking lot when everyone has shut down and usually the So5 staff has no idea this is going on and they are the first people I call and they don't know there's people in the parking lot. It's 10, 10 p.m. 10, 10 p.m. Right, and this is a week ago. We're going to keep going here. So amplification of sound, again, this is um, a zoning regulation uh, that is uh, in the clause. There actually should be no amplification of sound at all. So this is just a tiny clip of like the music that's coming from this after hours. You see the lights are off and there is still lots of music. This one's a little, that one's a little harder to hear. Um, these are donuts in the parking lot. It sounds like some of my, my friends here also have this issue. This is from my window. Doing donuts in the parking lot. I mean, this is a, this is a nightly occurrence until Tuesday. And I think I just have one more for, okay, there's light distribution. You can see the light is coming right into our home um, and uh, playing outdoors while the, the courts are closed. Lights are off. January 24. You might be hearing the sound from So5 out my window as well as this video as I'm playing it for you as well. But I think you get the point. I don't need to belabor it here. Let's see if I can stop this video for you. But this is every night, and, and poor Commissioner Zyg Zygmuntfeld has gotten these from me every night because we're starting to go a little crazy here. Um, as I was writing this today, this PowerPoint for you, at 7.10, the lights were off in the court, and we had people out there playing for 30 minutes. Um, and, and so I'm just seeking your help. We cannot continue this. Um, here are some quotations that I've uh, talked to that I've gathered from the employees. Take a moment, just read them for yourself. I don't have to read them to you. Uh, that's real live so five in the back if, you, if you're hearing it. Allie, I think you've more than made your point and I okay. want to now kind of okay. amplify your points um, and, and thank you for acknowledging things. Unfortunately, we've not been able to get things remedied uh, to a reasonable level and, and except uh, within the last week. So let me just do a quick summary from, from the actions that you know occurred. Last week, there was a summit meeting with the senior ownership of SO5 who actually flew in from California. Um, and in that meeting was Lieutenant Slavin, uh, Code Enforcement, uh, Al, Al Sergio, Commissioner Brockington and myself. And we raised the issues of noise, door, the, the excessive noise during play, the noise after play, the parking lot hijinks, particularly donuts, and the use for, of the lot for celebration, the after hours unauthorized use, the lighting bleed into the local homes. Um, we asked uh, Lieutenant Slavin, I'll just recast that he doesn't have to, he indicated that there were 28 police calls over the last three years with 11 occurring in 2021, 86% of those calls occurred Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or Fridays. With the ownership, we discussed the possibility of them reducing the hours of operation, of taking control of both the noise and lighting um, problems, and taking um, serious action on parking lot maintenance. Here is what they claimed, and from what um, Ali has indicated there is some indication that they've started some of that intervention. They claim that they've uh, invested approximately $40,000 of expense in bringing in private security and expanding their camera network and actually having cameras that track noise by decibel levels. The other thing that they indicated was that the less than responsive 
former site director has resigned from their business and they brought in a new site director. So we've asked them to give us a very specific commitment to not only do that on Tuesday, but to do that across the board um, until we have a steady level of reduction, both in the noise and that kind of thing. They've also indicated that they will refocus uh, the lights, either add filters or refocus the lights to reduce the bleed and that kind of thing. This meeting occurred last Thursday uh, for about an hour and a half. Obviously, there's been small amounts of improvement, but to Ali and your neighbor's indication, it's not acceptable. Um, we need to, in, you know, to obviously increase uh, both the enforcement and uh, ratcheting down those things. And I think we, we will try and do that. And, I, and frankly, if it doesn't work, I think then that we need to contemplate taking uh, some action that would enforce or force or changes for both the, the noise and some of the, um, and some of the um, maintenance issues and control issues in the parking lot. Sometimes that whether they know it or not, they are legally and professionally responsible to cut that down. So that's what I would share, that this is, this is not a new problem as Ali and her neighbors have mentioned. We've done a number of things to try and bring it under control. The only time it's been uh, mitigated is during COVID when they were pretty much shut down. So we, you know, we've continued to understand and we've expanded the network of those from the township staff who are involved in trying to bring this under control. So the promise here, Ali and your neighbors is, you know, we've, we've not started the process, but we've increased and expanded the process. And if it doesn't start to, to minimize and get under control, we will then have to take on some of the more legal activities that are available to us. And I hope that at least shows that we've done what we could, um, particularly recently as things have escalated as you've indicated. So I just wanted to, to share that both with your neighbors and with the rest of the community and with the fact that there are things that are happening on many of our private and public lots that need to be brought under control. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Zignanfeld. Just one other thing, um, because this is kind of like the, we wanted to kind of lay out like there's so many things across the board that need to be mitigated. And there's a lot of things that you're, you're supporting and advocating on our behalf to mitigate. The, the, the biggest thing that like, if we could make one thing go away it is these hours of operation until 10 p.m., especially on the weekdays. And if there was a compromise that existed such that on the weekends, play till 10, <laughs> then you need to leave. But on the weekdays, my goodness, my kids need to sleep. We need to work. We need to sleep. That has to be limited until 8 p.m. I mean, that is where we would want your support. That is kind of the next step of this. But I feel like that's kind of the minimum of what we need to have any sustainability and any kind of like... Uh, peace of mind about coexisting, um, you know, and this is after after five years of, of, of dealing with this and now it's amplified to every single night. So that would be the request that I would make. Allie, um, I was at the meeting um, and I, I'm still disappointed, not with you, but with, with SoFi. Um, and I think hearing the noise from my home, <laughs> you know, through this call, lets us know what you're dealing with. Um, I personally 100% agree with you that the hours of operation for the indoor or the outdoor courts, Monday through Thursday, need to change and they need to go down. That's how I feel. Um, I think it does um, because it's, I mean, our kids need to go to school. Our kids, you know, so Monday through Thursday, I, you know, Commissioner Zygmunt felt, I think we need to meet with them again. Um, we heard it for ourselves on this call. Um, and that was just the fans because you got the referees with the whistles. Uh, we didn't even hear that. You know, every soccer game has one or two referees. So they're blowing whistles at quarter to 10 at night. And to me, that's not acceptable. And I have to agree with you, Allie, that I truly think that at least Monday through Thursday, that time should be reduced. Um, I know that's something they won't be happy with, um, but I, I think it's something that needs to be discussed. I, I, I truly do. 
So I, I'm going to go with Commissioner Rappaport, then we're sort of going to move on because we still have two more committee meetings tonight, guys. Um, we really do. That. We still have two more meetings tonight. And so we're going to sort of move along a little bit quicker. If we can. I just want to say one, I just want to say one thing real quick. Um, Evan Wilson, Who's, I'm Allie's husband. There, just so everyone knows, it's not just us, right? It's not just the three people on this call. Oh, probably we know about, that. Oh, there's we probably about that. 40 or 50 houses oh, we know, that we're, we know, we're trying to be a voice with all this. You know what, Evan? Even if it was you, just you three, there would still be an issue. So yeah. it's not about the numbers. To me, yeah. it's not about the numbers. I don't care if it's one or 40. That's It's too loud on a Wednesday night. Yeah. Um, so, Commissioner Rappaport. Yeah, thank you. And I'll be quick. I think our, our noise ordinances, I mean, last time I read them, it has, not, it has very little to do with the hours of operation. The noise from one property isn't supposed to interfere and enter the homes and, and destroy the uh, enjoyment of property by any other property. I mean, so once the noise level, tr uh, in a sense, trespasses, beyond its borders, it's violating our noise ordinances. So uh, to me, this, this is a fairly straightforward, uh, uh, you know, unless I'm missing something, uh, it isn't about uh, so far hours of operation, it's about code enforcement and, and uh, property, property issues. So again, I, 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 911 to me is the, uh, the first uh, remedy and the second one is to close down yeah, to watch the parking, uh, the parking lot, and the uh, the activities when they when they become uh, aggressive to the neighbors, that's time to shut it down. Everybody leaves, so that's it. Well, uh, commis commis commissioner, if I may, uh, yes, go this, ahead. This is unacceptable. Um, I've asked the police to enforce this now. Hit this area hard. Uh, Lieutenant Slavin just uh, dispatched police over there right now because of the noise that's taking place. It's unacceptable. Uh, we will be hitting this area pretty hard. Uh, I will talk to our codes people about uh, noise, uh, what Commissioner Rappaport talked about, violations, and we're gonna hit them pretty hard so that commissioners, when you meet with them the next time, uh, they're gonna either come to the table or they're gonna have problems on a daily basis because it should not impact the quality of life. Just goes back to the same thing with the donuts in the high school parking lot and that. It's right. unacceptable and it's time to stop. Hey, Bob, Ms. can you Mr. also, Chairman. Can you, one second, um, Commissioner Armin. Bob, can you also add, um, have Al go out and take a look at the lights? We absolutely will. And I'll work with Scott. We will get a light meter on that too. And we will also, we'll hit them on facts because if that, the light is a problem there, it's in violation. So we will hit them on all fronts. I'll Thank actually, you. I'll actually stop there on the way home tonight. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you, Scott. Commissioner Armin. Just real quick, the, the, the other avenue, in, in addition to law enforcement and enforcement of our noise ordinance, which, by the way, I think um, needs some improvement. And maybe that's something we as a board should uh, start looking at and staff should start looking at. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, as Ms. Wilson mentioned, there may be uh, zoning violations. There's the violations of the approvals in the zoning hearing board. And that is something that certainly the township uh, can and should enforce through our uh, zone planning and zoning office. Thank you. We're already Thank working you. on that uh, decibel ordinance. Perfect. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, Allie, thank you. Uh, Mr. and Mr. Wilson, thank you guys both for jumping on. And again, it's not about the numbers. We're gonna take care of this. It's, it's not right. And and again, I like so five. I, my daughters, my grandkids, they play there, but they're not loud, they're indoors. So, but it's the outdoors that we have to deal with. All right, guys, again, we have a lot of uh, stuff to do. I'm gonna go to Kimberly. If, if it's something we've already talked about, guys, please, out of respect, we're gonna, we, we're gonna move forward, but we're gonna open up Kimberly. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to add a comment onto that last discussion. I had a, a nice little presentation for you as well, but I'm not going to take your time for that. Um, I just wanted to tell you, thank you. Um, I like my hands are trembling a little bit because of like of happiness, because I feel like we've been heard. We've been heard before. Um, 
you, sir, Mr. Brockington, um, as well as Mr. Mitch, you guys have, have definitely listened and we really appreciate you. And I don't want this to sound in any way when we say things like this has been going on for years that we are um, ungrateful for the way that you've been paying attention. You have been, and we really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to, um, I just wanted to piggyback just a tiny bit onto um, what you were talking about with the, um, the ordinances and the zoning board hearing, I just have a couple of notes um, for, if you look up appeal number 1571, appeal number 1571 from the Cheltenham Township Zoning Hearing Board, that might help you find some of the things you're looking for. Um, the things listed there were, there shall be no, there shall be sight and sound barriers erected on Church Road and Ellen Lane side of the premises. Um, and then a second noise related one was that the external air conditioning shall not emit sound that measures 55 decibels or greater and any other emitted sounds should be directed toward the interior of the property and away from the sound barriers. And um, I, I have my mute off, so I'm sure you'll be able to hear <laughs> so five as well. Um, but 55 decibels is a percolating coffee machine. And I don't think any of us find that irritating. So the sound that's coming from there, I really appreciate you saying that you're going to check the sound levels, check the light levels. That is, um, that's really, really helpful. My three kids are in school as well. And um, once we turn off our air conditioners, um, which we are leaving on now unnecessarily because of the noise, but once we turn those off, they have a really difficult time. Um, they're in high school now, and it's, it's just been really tough on them, on their mental health. And they're really hard workers, but it's just, it's just really hard. So again, I don't want to take up any more of your time with this. I appreciate what you're doing. I mean, the fact that you're sending a team out now to check on it is fantastic. Um, we just really need to protect our kids and checking into the noise ordinances and making sure that they're abiding by those in our residential zone would be really helpful. And then we also need them to shut down outdoors by 8 p.m. Um, during the week. During the weekends, we can be tolerant and reasonable for what it is. We know people who live near the high school have to deal with the same things on Friday nights and we're totally fine with that. But shutting down at a reasonable time around 8 p.m., which is what it was before when it was a tennis play, um, would be really helpful. So thank you. Thank you. you. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment to say, um, our Scott Lynch, uh, we're gonna say if you need to jump off this meeting because they closed down at, 11, at 10, if you wanna jump off and go by there now, do so. Please, you don't need to stick here. You know, just be careful. Don't hit your head again. Feel the love there. I feel the love. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so jump off and take care of that so you can jump over there. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go with Linda and then Teresa, and then we're going to um, move on and adjourn the meeting for public safety. Hello, Ms. Moore. Hello, I will not take long. I basically want to uh, piggyback on the remarks about the traffic situation um, on Church and Greenwood. Um, as you know, I live on Spruce Lane and trying to turn out of here has become quite, the, um, quite a challenge, including one day when I couldn't turn right or left. Left is always what's hardest because everybody is lined up it's like the traffic sometimes is lined up during rush hour from the intersection all the way over the bridge and starting back up the hill. Um, and I think that level of traffic speaks to the fact that whatever it is, the algorithm, the ways, whoever that rooted this this way is not serving anybody's needs, including those who think they're taking a, a shortcut. The other thing is about the speeding. Um, for a long time, I didn't notice that. But now if I turn out onto Church or Greenwood, either one, uh, in the direction that these people are doing the pass through, people tailgate you. I drive 10 miles over the speed limit and I'm being tailgated. Um, it's, it just really is, it's, it's bad. And I had said, I hate to just clear myself a soothsayer, but on the afternoon before the accident happened, I sat here with my daughter and said, you know, it's, it's a matter of time before somebody gets hurt out there. And she pointed and said, oh, the cops are out there now. And it was the accident that had happened. So um, I found, and one final thing, 
I found that the, the letter um, from PennDOT is, it feels to me as a journalist, like obfuscating and pushing and passing bucks and not necessarily facing what the issues are. And I am hoping that uh, when we get <clears throat> the results of whatever kind of study they're doing, that there will be an opportunity to address this in, head on in a way that, that will um, make this neighborhood more livable and safer for everybody. So then I shut up now, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. But I, can, I, I just wanna say, I sort of drive the speed limit. I get tailgated no matter where I go. Mm -hmm. If you drive the speed limit now, I don't care if it's Greenwood Church, Shelmham, Washington Lane, or Brookfield Road where I live, you're gonna get tailgated if you're going the speed limit, no matter where you drive these days. Um, all right, we have two more. We have Teresa and then we'll do Edie. Hi there, um, I'll be real quick. I just wanna thank Lieutenant Slavin for sending out the patrol car to Bent. Uh, we've been here a long time. I can't remember last time I saw patrol car out and uh, appreciate some semblance of police presence and um, encourage uh, a regular occurrence uh, with that. Um, I'd also like to um, just to note that uh, we've been at this for a long time discussing traffic issues and we really welcome some solid action from the township and the police department regarding our issues. Today, I sent out a, um, a response or list of questions that have come forward from the neighbors. And we'd like to have some time to go over that with our commissioners and the township manager at some point. I would like to comment that I do find um, uh, Bob's, uh, uh, PowerPoint presentation helpful. Um, it points up more clearly uh, what is possible, even though the letter itself felt very ambivalent about uh, cost and timeline and uh, what actually would take place. So I think that the, the questions that are, were presented today in the document that I responded to, it would be helpful to have some time to go over that. Uh, basically, main issues of uh, cost, timeline, and this recently recurring um, question about infrastructure. So um, I would like to comment on that the closer I look at the infrastructure issue, the more nervous I get. I'm about 12 feet from um, an Enbridge marker, and um, it comes to be that they're not just, uh, there's not just one pipeline. There are actually four connecting lines and uh, side-by-side -side lines. So um, we'd like to have some reassurance and some answers either from Texas Western uh, or the township regarding this. And possibly we can meet with, I think, is his name, uh, Roger Phillips, uh, the township engineer regarding that. So thank you, and I'll be in touch with you, Township Manager, to see when we can get together with Commissioner Holland and and um, Commissioner Pransky. And you, Irv, you're always invited. Oh, you know I'll be there. <laughs> thank you. Then. Um, okay. Have a good evening. Edie? I'd like to start by adding my voice of appreciation for the work that our police officer, EMS, and volunteer fire park firefighters do every day, and the patience of the commissioners tonight. Um, tonight's participation shows the importance of these public meetings and the importance of residents having access to them. The township has been doing an admirable job of keeping residents informed through video conference, teleconferencing, the township website, the Facebook pages, and the YouTube channel. Um, I've been trying to get an answer on why the September video of this committee meeting, the public affairs meeting and the finance committee meetings were not posted. The minutes were posted, but they don't take the place of the video. Um, I'm asking at this meeting because I was particularly interested in Mr. Ziankowski's presentation and any commentary about the review of traffic issues from the, the, the PennDOT report that um, um, Teresa was just speaking about. Um, and I've just left my place, which I always do. 
Um, since the replays on cable TV have been suspended, the posted videos are residents only way to see the meetings. I'd like to know why these committee meetings um, weren't posted um, and will they be posted in the future? Uh, when you say committee meetings, what meetings are you speaking of? You're, you're talking about the September public safety? The September public safety meeting, the September um, finance committee meeting and the September um, public affairs meetings, uh, the videos were not posted. posted. There were technical problems, if anybody remembers, that we had a storm and there were technical problems that occurred. We lost some of the, you know, some of the connectivity. So uh, there, that may be one of the contributing factors, Edie. Okay, so Bob, they will, go ahead. Bob, do you know the issue with that? Uh, Allison, I know that you've been working on that. All right, Edie, if we don't have an answer for you tonight, we'll, we'll get you an answer tomorrow. Okay. I'm sure Bob will reach out to you for sure tomorrow with an answer okay, on what's thank going you. on with that. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you, Edie. All right, guys, I'm calling for the adjournment of tonight's public safety committee meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.